What's up? It is 3 p.m. on a Sunday afternoon. Thanks for tuning in for another episode of Cannabis Legalization News. Today, we're joined by Alex Boutros and Mo Williams from Cannabis Equity Illinois Coalition. We're going to talk about expunging your record and criminal justice reform. So let's just get right into it. Hey, Tom, Miggy, Mo, and Alex. Thanks for joining us today. Well, yeah, Thanks. Thanks, thanks for having us. We're really excited to discuss all things expungement with you guys today. And then first, I wanted to remind everybody that we do now have a new page on our Cannabis Industry Lawyer website. Uh, it's Cannabis Industry Lawyer backslash courses. And our first one was just uploaded. And uh, that's where I got this. It's the activism day. And so like uh, one of the aspects of the course of how to appeal your cannabis denial was we need some legislative reform. Uh, however, one of the things that they did put in that it looks like they're going to get right as opposed to the 10 license cap limit for the dispensaries uh, is this automatic expungement and the other expungement uh, aspects of the Illinois law. So thanks so much for coming on to discuss. Uh, uh, is it, what is it? Is it uh, Cannabis Equity Illinois? Sure is. Awesome. Tell us a little bit about Cannabis Equity Illinois. Sure. Um, hello. Thank you so much for having us on here. Um, Cannabis Equity Illinois Coalition is a little bit over a year old now. And so our mission is, our coalition is a grassroots nonprofit of community members fighting to ensure that legalization of cannabis is done to repair and reinvest in communities most impacted by the war on drugs. Um, and so we started a little over a year ago when legalization was the hot topic down in Springfield because there was a major call from community members for equity, um, for repair of the harm done by the war on drugs, especially in Chicago. Yeah. And just the fact that when you look at all the cannabis industry across this country, you know, legalization across the world is owned by couple rich white guys rich white guys <laughs> yeah. and we're like hmm, have you ever been arrested for cannabis or scared yeah. for your life uh no okay well guess you shouldn't be owning the industry um and so that is what we're here trying to do yeah, and then what, mo oh sorry uh, that's why we have our sunday shows we do activism on sunday and that's a large aspect of the movement and that's one of the reasons why i think the license cap issue was i think illinois did a lot of good but there was a lot of ignorance just because there's a lot of ignorance in general in our cannabis laws. But then they didn't really understand that so many people would apply and spend like a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars on application, non-refundable application fees alone to stuff the lottery so that, you know, here's all the social equity. And then what happens? 21 teams out of 700 because somebody wants to come in and take all the licenses. And so there's, there's other things that we can do to uh, amend the law, but, uh, uh, Mo, what's coming up uh, next week for for uh, equity purposes? Uh, National Expungement Week. Uh, it starts the week of the 19th, um, and the coalition is hosting a, a couple of events um, um, for National Expungement Week. So um, on the 19th, we start with a, re a rebroadcast of... Um, a webinar uh, that our team held um, alongside Legal Aid Chicago uh, that just provides um, individuals checking out the webinar with information on how they can go about getting their record um, expunged. Um, on the 20th, um, we're hosting um, another event, oh What's up, bro? Um, the Wraparound Resource Fair. Um, it's uh, going to be held in person um, at uh, Precious Blood Ministries, on the south side of Chicago, 51st and Elizabeth. Um, so there you can get information on the various services that are available to uh, the folks that have been um, kind of struggling to, um, you know, just rebuild uh, their lives after, you know, receiving uh, some sort of cannabis related conviction. So, um, as you guys are aware, uh, for many people, they, they may not know about their voting rights. They um, may be in need of housing, um, food assistance, employment assistance. Just speaking on a personal note and the reason why I joined the coalition, um, I attended a cannabis resource fair um, at UIC um, in February, um, pre-COVID. Um, <laughs> and... Um, yeah, I, I wasn't sure how I wanted to get involved. I have relatives, um, my brother included, who 
um, has a cannabis conviction and he hasn't worked in over a decade because of that conviction. Mm. So um, the coalition, they were able to help him out um, after the at the uh, Get Your Rap Sheet event uh, that was held, I think it was last weekend um, on the on the 4th. Uh, so he started the process of, of getting his record expunged. Um, so yeah, the, the coalition is just doing a, a lot of great work um, with the, the webinar that um, we're hosting, uh, the in-person research source fair, the, the virtual resource fair um, that'll be later in the, that week. So yeah, that's that's what we've been up to really. Nice. So expungement is not uh, automatic uh, in Illinois, even with the new law? So... Um, it's very limited. Um, we were fighting when we went down to Springfield last year, you know, alongside of fighting for a good pot of money to actually support social equity applicants and, you know, a refund of application licenses for folks that like weren't granted uh, even access to the lottery, which, you know, sounds really important now. Um, it was also around expungement. We were fighting for expungement to be expanded automatically to every cannabis conviction because if white men can be moving pounds on pounds on pounds of weed right now, then there should not be one person of color that is behind bars for that. Um, and so we do um, a good amount of work around that. And what came out in the legislation was automatic expungement uh, for standalone cannabis charges that were misdemeanors yeah. um, and it gets very comp like more complicated and very nuanced so like a level four felony is the most I think that's about 500 grams um, whether it was I think possession or selling that could be automatically expunged if the state's attorney of that county you know the district prosecutor decides that they want to also extend that automatic expungement um, it gave the governor, you know, pardoning um, power over a certain amount of cannabis convictions or charges. And so our state's attorney, Kim Fox, she is very arguably the most progressive uh, state's attorney um, in Illinois. Uh, and so she decided to go ahead and she will automatically expunge all of the expungible cannabis charges. Um, however, the issue is that number one, it has to be standalone. That's mm. not a common thing. You know, no. also um, there's a l amount of waiting period for expungements because we have a crazy backlog, like a crazy backlog in Chicago and Illinois. You can, it, you can file for expungement. It could take up to eight to 12 to two years, um, eight months to 12 months to two years to actually have it go through. And so there's a lot of folks that were told, you know, hey, you have a standalone cannabis charge and it will be automatically expunged by this year, uh, but don't you don't have to wait for that. You know, you could just go ahead and do that process on your own and get that started. Um, and so that's where, you know, our coalition ca came in with our Get Your Rap Sheet Day because we understand that as a coalition, there are so many legal aid partners and legal aid organizations doing the work already. We don't need to reinvent the wheel and try to just be another person doing this work. We need to identify the gaps where we're actually needed um, and where we were needed was helping people get their rap sheet. That's step one. If you want to expunge your record or seal your record is you need to know what's on your record uh, and you need to have that physical paper. And yeah. then we can work with our partners at Legal Aid Chicago or Cabrini Green Legal Aid who are able to provide full representation for people uh, whether that's free or low cost for us, it's been pro bono to start nice. that process for people. Um, you can do it on your own, you know, be a pro se person. Um, but I mean, even if you speak English, navigating courts is so difficult. Oh, it happens uh, a lot anyway. You don't even, and it happens yeah. a lot anyway. So, but, but Mo, you said your brother is affected by the same this issue, and is this is this case a state or a federal? Um, state. So yeah, and um, I grew up in West Inglewood, uh, so you know it's it's not just my brother; it's just uh, quite a few people that I've grown up with, um, know and love, and yeah, yeah. Most generations. Yeah, mostly the state. The state's the one that enforces the crimes. It's very rare that the feds actually come in and bust. I mean, it's right. usually of the arrests that are out there are from the state level. And then you guys highlighted as to like, we have levels of possession, but also equity 
like possession to a certain extent. So if you, like uh, Alex was mentioning, if you're caught with just simple possession of over a pound, 500 grams, that can be expunged, but it's still illegal, which is weird. And so like, you know, you, you, because that's true, it's like, it's, but it's strange. And so like some of my buddies, you know, they were caught with 638 grams and I'm like, oh man, you were almost a social equity applicant. You were just too greedy, bro. You should have been caught with less weed. <laughs> and so like, there's that, that aspect of it, but then they're trying to go out and, and uh, grant all these uh, expungements and they created something called a minor expunge, no minor cannabis offense, which is like an ounce of possession, pure possession or less. And so uh, you guys might be able to answer this for me because I've been trying to find this out. There's like a small, it's a fairly large actually, because most arrests aren't for, they're for small amounts of cannabis. That's why Illinois decriminalized 10 grams of cannabis or less, but only in 2016. And so after 2016, if you were caught with 10 grams or less, a bag of weed, an eighth, something like that, you could even roll with a half O. No, wait, you couldn't, that's 14. Uh, and so, um, you know, but a quarter, hey. And so... Um, those are people that were arrested in 1998 for an eighth, like 3.5 grams. Do they count as social equity or as that? Because the, 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 the statute says social equity means that you are caught with this amount of weed and it has to be expungible under the act. And so by the time the act came about, uh, 10 grams or less had been uh, declared, you know, uh, a, a civil violation. So it's not something they would expunge for. But what about the ones before uh, uh, 2016, if you were caught for like a bag of weed? Uh, are those still social equity applicants? So as far as I know, and yeah. I should check, double check on this, so don't fully quote me, um, is that you should have, you would have been criminalized for cannabis. So you have a conviction, yeah. a charge, you have this on your record. Um, and that is what, that's how they, you know, created the, disproportionately impacted areas, social equity applicant definition, and that was included in there. Um, and so actually a big thing that we had to remind folks of that we're going through the application process is if you were criminalized for cannabis, then you should get your record because if it's automatically expunged and you can no longer get your record, you're not going to be able to prove that you were criminalized for cannabis um, and thus prove that you're a social equity applicant in that way. Um, and so we needed folks to go get that. Um, I wasn't aware if it was like you had to be criminalized for a specific amount of cannabis by this time. So I could be wrong on there. The, everything that I've seen was just you need to have a criminal conviction or charge. Yeah. It needs to be on your record. But how yeah. bizarro is that, though? I need to go get a copy of my police record first. Now, please, can you get rid of this fucker? Because I, I need to be a clean... I need to get a job. <laughs> it won't let me get licenses. Yeah. I need to get a job to pay for this license to do this application process. But I can't get a job to do this because it's on my record, but it needs to be on my record so I can apply for this. It's a terrible cycle. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm uh, equity, I so I have to act quick before they expunge my record. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like with that, how do let's let's talk real quick. How does people that are out there like, oh crap, they're gonna delete it? I need that for next round. How does somebody get their rap sheet? So in Chicago and Cook County, um, it's different in every county in Illinois. Um, but basically you need to go to the headquarters of the police. So in Chicago and Cook County, you need to go to CPD headquarters, which is on 35th and Michigan. Uh, they're only open like maybe two days out of the week uh, from like 8 to maybe 12 p.m. or like 1 p.m. during the week while people are at work uh, to go get your fingerprints. It's $16. Uh, but when you go, you should definitely get your juvenile rap sheet as well because that's free. And you're going to need that if there's stuff on your juvenile record anyways. Um, and so the first step is literally just going and getting fingerprinted. I would say you could definitely do that on your own. I would confirm, you know, when they're open before you go. We held a get your rap sheet event on a Friday. And that's because we had coordinated with CPD to do that beforehand. Um, they had shut down fingerprinting on Fridays beforehand. And so mm. that was in a service that's available on Fridays. Since we held an event there, they allowed walk-ins. So we reopened that service on a Friday yes. for folks that had shown up that did, weren't aware that it was shut down on Fridays. But since we had a whole event set up there, we could still take them Whereas if we were not there, they would have been turned away. 
So don't make the whole trip there unless you know that you're showing up to one of our events or you've confirmed <laughs> that this is a day that they're going to be open because um, folks will take off work. You know, people really go out of their way just to start this process. It's also not a fun process. We had several people that it's traumatizing to go to Chicago Police Department headquarters. That's not a fun thing to do if you've been criminalized or grown up anywhere where yeah. police, <laughs> you know, no, it, hard it's folks. To totally get it. Um, yeah, no, it, it, it sucks, though, but it's great that you guys uh, made them, well, at least enabled them to be open again on Fridays because, like you said, hardworking people have schedules. You know, it's kind of like court, yeah. how it screws up your whole life and recidivism and all that stuff come into play because – a six month court trial and I got to take off every other week from work. They don't go hand in hand. And I usually don't walk away with a job still, no matter what, because I'm just trying to protect myself unless I have that kind of job, which most people don't, you know? And it used to be even worse because beforehand you had to go find a time to get your fingerprints. And then you had to go back to pick it up during those same limited hours that they're open. Um, now during COVID you go get fingerprinted and then they will mail it to you. However, and then with our events, we have legally Chicago there. So when you do that, you sign a waiver so we can pick up your rap sheet for you and start the process for you for free, uh, right away. That's great. I mean, it is quite the process that most people, you know, it's kind of like eating, you know, you're like, mm, I'll just go to McDonald's and we'll get a burger instead of cooking it at home when you're thinking, uh, if I could just push a button and put my name in something and have the process started, you know, that, that's just freaking awesome. <laughs> yeah. And just one thing to keep in mind, um, the, the good thing is that there was that screening process as well, uh, just to touch on the, the traumatizing, you know, portion of, of the process that you mentioned, Alex, you know, you definitely don't want to head down there if, you know, you, you think you have an outstanding warrant or there's that potential, um, uh, that's why Legal Aid Chicago, um, it's great to have them involved uh, so that if you do think that you have an outstanding warrant or you're just not sure, um, you can um, get uh, legal support uh, just to to help you kind of look into, into that um, before you take a trip down to the, the police station and you're met with, you know, an unpleasant surprise. Yeah, definitely. So how's COVID impacting your events? I mean, you mentioned that you have them and then they're open. Uh, do you guys have limitations? Do you have to do social di distancing protocols? Yeah. So we've had some great partners or sponsors of our events that just make sure that we are fully equipped with masks and hand sanitizer that we can give out to everybody. Uh, we have to social distance in every way. Um as well as like with our community resource fair, it's a social distancing community resource fair. So when we went to do a site visit, we've already like mapped out like how each table will be mapped out, um, knowing that only we're only going to take about 50 to 100 people throughout the entire event, um, not at one time. So it's things like that, but it's also just being responsible in the way of like getting tested myself every week like i got right. tested yesterday um just so you know where you're at you know um and so it's definitely impacted our events a lot we had to cancel quite a few events at the height of covid right at the beginning um but also understanding that with our resource fair that's why we're also doing one virtually that same week contingency wise in case we feel like we have to cancel the in-person one but also knowing that the in-person one is important because there is a very large and real tech gap between folks that have recently gotten out of prison um, and so if you really want to ensure that folks are having access to resources um, sometimes you need to be in person um, but do it in a safe way where Everybody gets a little PPE kit, you know? If there's food, it's not being handed. It's like fully prepackaged, you know, things like that to be as safe as possible, um, but still get resources to folks. And so some of the resources at our fair will include SNAP benefit access, so like food stamps. Um, I'm gonna be there talking about voting rights with Chicago Votes. Uh, we'll have Legal Aid Chicago there talking about immigration. Um, law and things like that. So we're very excited. 
for uh, <laughs> Cannabis Equity in Illinois, I mean, you guys as an organization, because the expungement thing, you know, we're here talking about expungement for next week, but overall, you guys are a year-long program. What else are you guys doing? Uh, are you are you helping uh, besides expungement, perhaps even like the, the loan process? I mean, this whole thing, uh, it's not very um, laid out for the, 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 the guy just out of prison, you know? There's not much... Mm. Uh, resources. Uh, do you help? So, yeah. so our organization was literally born out of community members, Southwest side of Chicago, different. Um, if they were from out of Illinois coordinating with us here in Chicago, because we knew that this was not going to be for us. You know, we knew that if we wanted this law or legalization to be for us, we needed to be in Springfield. We need to be at the Capitol speaking with legislators and making our voice known. Um, and so everything that we do, we have weekly organizing meetings that are open to anybody that wants to be involved in this process and this movement. Um, and so all of our programming and all of the initiatives that we do are led by the people most impacted by the war on drugs and by prohibition of cannabis. Um, and so every week, folks can bring any issue that's interested to them um, to bring to the full group to have conversations. So definitely the conversation uh, has been around the licenses because that is what so many people need to talk about, want to talk about. You know, many of our coalition members are social equity applicants themselves. Oh man, Alex, you have a wonderful neighborhood filled. With I almost hit the ground for a second, dude. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, sorry about that. Um, yeah, that's typical Chicago okay. for you. Typical for Chicago. Um, that's what in you the do alleys. The <laughs> you just so lay on the horn, and then in people any are like, alley, oh, <laughs> definitely. Um, <laughs> But yeah, that's been the topic. So we recently released a letter, which you can find on our Instagram, our Facebook, our Twitter. That what's your, is what's your IG handle? At Canna Equity I L. At Canna Equity I L on IG. Awesome. IG, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, and we sent out a letter asking and demanding for the delay of this lottery or these licenses. We were asking for the bare minimum of transparency. Can you please what? just tell us? What the heck was going on? Not even me. Can you tell a social equity applicant what, like, what their scores were? Why does a social equity applicant have to request ask their own for scores? Them. Exactly. And then why, when you ask for them, does it take time? And then when you get them, it's it's just two numbers. It's one line of yeah. And then your numbers. And then you're like, wait a minute. And so that's, yeah, you can go to the course. Uh, maybe I'll give it free for social equity after another week because I'm going to give it free for my my current clients. And then I just walk you through everything you need to know about the appeals process because face facts, J.B. Pritzker is not stopping shit. Uh, these are his people and because they knew, they watched, they got this thing a week before they announced it. They were like, all right, cool. And so uh, I just don't see him stopping or like doing anything. And then if what are you supposed to do? Well, if you read the law, it says you have the administrative review process. But, you know, that's something that if you sit out and you wait on your rights, uh, it might be too late. But then also, like, seriously, uh, one of the winners applied for 38 effing licenses. You're allowed 10. That's okay. it. And so like you're going to throw and then there is and this is something like we don't know this. Did the state of Illinois check this? Uh, for the social equity half price admission for the, the ticket, the lottery ticket, which was a $5,000 non-refundable fee, if your social equity is $2,500, unless your team makes more than three quarter of a million dollars a year, and I'm pretty damn sure a lot of those teams are going to afford to spend $200,000, $100,000 on application fees alone, probably makes more than $750,000 a year. So uh, shouldn't that, did they, did they pay full price or are we supposed to disqualify them? Or at least are they supposed to get a 10 day notice that said something was missing? Like nobody else did, you know, it's just basically, so annoying. Basically there's a lot of questions. Yeah. There's a lot of questions that are unanswered and it makes us feel just like gaslighting. You're just doing this, expecting no one to speak out, but I don't, I'm sure you've heard there's a lot of noise. There's a lot of noise going around. People mm -hmm. are speaking out about, you know, we know that we personally know certain social equity applicants that did make it in the process, but we also know that that was such a small amount of people and that it looks extremely fishy at the folks that won so many 
licenses, the social equity applicants that we know that won licenses won at most two. They didn't yeah. win 10. It's like they sprinkled it in, you know, just kind of like, yeah. Yeah, this, will it, this will make it seem There's like There's a couple was. people here. They're not going to say anything. What you right? hearing this, yeah. Right. Yeah, and it's just so freaking ridiculous. And then you see all that stuff and they have no scores. And then they get no 10 day notices that they're missing stuff. And then they just come out. And then uh, now I still have not known anybody, any team that has gotten a score that's not just numbers. That's like, here's what you missed and why. But I do know a lot of social equity teams that have called me like, they didn't give me my social equity points. I'm like, what? How not, how are you not, you know, like, and so that's one of the reasons why I was asking at the top of the hour. I'm like, okay, I'm arrested 1998, 2.5 grams of cannabis. I was arrested. I, I took a, I, I had something on my record that counts, right? I mean, like, you're not going to sit there and say, oh, I'm sorry. It wasn't enough. It wasn't enough weed. It has to be between 10 and 500 grams. And then like, I still can't believe, okay, you, you actually do some drug dealing uh, for cannabis. <laughs> Uh, to make some money to feed your daughter uh, and you're selling, you know, 600 grams as opposed to 500. Sorry, bro. You're still fucked. It's just so ridiculous. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely stacked against you. Oh, so much stacked against you. And then they're just going to hold the lottery. They're just like, so this is it. Come and then, so that's one of the things. And that's why I'm on front of this, uh, the March. And I think that is the 2017 March, but it's public domain. That's why I was able to use it. I'm not going to have Getty images sue me for using it. And so um, that's that's true. you know. And so then um, the thing is, one of the things that I'm proposing for next round is we should have a license cap of one. And so there would be 100 next round, there'd be 110 seats at the table for social equity applicants. And again, nothing against veterans, but they are about six or seven percent of the population of Illinois. They should not be 100 percent of the cannabis industry, just like white guys like me should not be 100 percent of the cannabis industry. You know, if the whole thing, if you read the law, I mean, besides social equity, it's about diversity so that it reflects the community it serves. Yeah. Uh, and, and so that everybody feels welcome. That's cool. But then suddenly, like if it's 100 percent veteran owned as opposed to 7 percent veteran owned, it's. It's it's not equitable. It's 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 rigged. To, but you know, that's... but it seems rigged, right? Like the the uh, oh, yeah. it seems corruption. Uh, even to call it a lottery seems like a a farce. Like this is not random. This is not uh... like calling it a lottery like that, and like having it. So and the tickets. Okay, so how many lottery tickets would you like to buy? I just say like here in Washington, our corruption. At least you have recourse, like with this lawsuits and the suing and chasing after because of the way your law is implemented. Here, the, the the Washington State Liquor Control Board, um, they settled out of court for secret meetings they had while they were setting up the rules for the R502 present day industry. They settled with somebody who was about to go and expose them. And uh, uh, and it was in, a, in the papers and it didn't make any bigger of a headline because, it, you know, marijuana issues are, are like passe to most freaking people, which in, in to us. Don't care. Yeah, don't but. Care. It's us as, as it's the most important with this whole burning buildings and Black Lives Matters and all the shit going on. Cannabis prohibition is like the gasoline that that is part of this. Like if we were just to end marijuana prohibition, give everybody a fair chance. I mean, I've seen people start from seed and become millionaires. It's freaking possible. And that's what's important is that when you say fair, is that what we actually mean is equitable. I think that's something that people don't fully understand the difference between equality or equity. Equality is the idea that you just give everyone the same thing, but you don't take into account people's needs. You don't take into account um, criminalization and how that's impacted somebody and the fact that like, maybe you can't afford a lawyer that writes all of your applications. Um, but also the fact that folks submitted the two of the same application and got different scores because KPMG was a no bid contract and there's no transparency around where that came from. Um, and so there's a lot of different issues in here. And so basically our coalition, who we are is the watchdog. We are just acting as a watchdog over this entire industry, even though we for sure don't have the capacity to do that by any means, but we are doing it anyways. Um, you know, you asked about some of our other programs. One of them is the Cannabis Community Benefits Agreement program that focuses specifically on the multi-state operators that were, through the legislation, given a plus one dispensary license, um, which is even 
more insane considering what we just saw come out of these licenses. Um, and so we show up to every single community zoning meeting in Chicago for these licenses and we speak out and we say, hey, you were given this, sign a contract with us saying you're gonna do basically not even a step above the bare minimum called for in the legislation, like hiring, talking about um, doing Know Your Rights events, being a part of National Expungement Week with us. Um, and so like the COLA group out of Nature's Care Company owned by Acreage Farms signed our first community benefits agreement. And so from that community benefits agreement, we have already been able to um, shovel or shove maybe guide some job opportunities coming out of this new dispensary to our coalition members. Right. Also the COLA group paid uh, for 40 of our rap sheets that we provided to people. So it's things like that, but that was a contract, you know, it's not something where it's like, Oh, you're going to do this for us. Right. I believe you. It's like, no, this, we did it. We creating actual partnerships that are legally binding. Um, Cause that's really the only way we know we're going to get things. <laughs> yeah, bullshit. Uh, all right. Let me tell you how business works. You have the contract. <laughs> you're obligated to do it. You take the money. If you don't get it done, sue me. Exactly. Exactly. And you know, so, why do you think they hire more people? Do you think they're trying to avoid unionization? I don't even know. It seems like unionization doesn't even completely work in many spaces where they do have it. You're hearing a lot of different issues come out. Um, and so that's why we're trying to just focus on what we can do <laughs> realistically as a coalition, yeah. which is actually a lot. You know, we really can do a lot and we're only a year old and we're already here. Um, and so now well, that we're a nonprofit. If your law was actually implemented fairly and equally to your citizens, you know, you wouldn't need to exist. This wouldn't need to be a thing, but, which is fortunate it, it is. Well, it seems honestly, um, there's always going to need to be accountability. No matter what, there's not a regulation a cannabis regulation like commission on the state level. So if there's no one there to regulate it, then we need to exist. I think no matter what, when we pass laws, there's always that implementation phase that's forgotten about, which is the most important phase. Like people get really excited that we passed the law. Oh, great. Okay. But then no one stays around to actually watch to see what happened. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Make sure that things are enforced. Um, that the laws on the books are enforced and it's done so fairly. Yeah. Well, this goes back to my, like just cannabis to be considered as like a child's play type thing, right? Like it's only a joint bro. Or, you know, when they, people who don't smoke say like lighten up, like I'm not going to freaking light up. There's people in jail. There's people like my life is in, in danger. every time I cross state line and Tom knows I'm trying to not to curse as I talk, like this is right. What but Idaho, Idaho makes you curse, man. Idaho makes you curse. <laughs> Like Iowa, like and people are asking about Wisconsin and Indiana. Chicago like, makes you curse. I mean, prohibition, though, man. You just like, it, we're, we're ruining lives. We're and, and it's like okay. At what point will a cannabis person like the outrage, the the the, the anger? You know, like it took George Floyd to have a knee to his neck to 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 get the world mad, to get America mad. Whereas the cannabis guy is going to die alone in prison. You know, there's gonna be no cameras. The cannabis person's gonna have their shit taken away from them, have their kids taken away. Or they get yeah. hooked onto the uh the recidivism aspect because they're just put on a bullshit treadmill they can't get off. And mm -hmm. no one's gonna talk I, about that's it. Not, that's I mean, when you think about what justice is supposed to actually mean, that makes no fucking sense. That we create a system where these people are gonna be prejudiced their whole life. And so like, we don't have a, it, it, we do, it's a purely penal system. It's, it shouldn't be called the department of corrections. It should be the department of heinous fucking punishments or something where they just have to be the asshole they are and own it as opposed to saying, this is for your own good pee in this cup. I mean, so my, mm -hmm. my yeah. full-time job is with Chicago votes and we work a lot in the intersection of the American legal system, which is what we call it. Cause it's not, can't call it the criminal justice system. Um, it's the American legal system and voting rights. And so something that I do wanna make sure that we talk about is that in Illinois specifically, when you are released from serving a conviction, you have the right to vote. 
it is a huge misconception um, that you've lost your right to vote forever. And it's just not true. The second you are released, if you are not on furlough, if you are not currently serving that conviction um, inside of a correctional institution, you have the right to vote and you should. Um, and that's something that, you know, we're also trying to change because you should have the right to vote in prison yeah. to have a say on unjust laws. <laughs> Well, you know, the expungement thing, and I was just thinking about it. It's like I have to file this paperwork to be considered a citizen again, to be considered a human being, right? Like you, you mess up, you have something bad happen, you do something wrong, and now you're not a human being because uh, you messed up. But, hey, seven years later, you can now get it written off because now you're good, right? But uh, In guys- Illinois, okay. there, are, there are around 1,189 unique permanent punishment laws. There's not only waiting periods where you have to wait a certain amount of years before you can even file for expungement. Then there's all these other permanent pu- punishment laws that can stop you from maintaining housing, qualifying for public assistance, higher Financial education. Financial aid. Yeah. Exactly. And, and that, that's what I was going to try and lead to is like, have you guys thought about maybe because most people who commit crimes or, or mess up, whatever, right? Because I, I can't, you know, again, that's why the background, no victim, no crime. I don't think it's a crime. You're not a bad human being, but society thought you were and then you you go on with your life you get a job you're like you know what f this i'm just gonna be a nine to five sludge and this is all gonna do flip burgers whatever but if you had a place to go look and be like oh shit if i were to get my expungement i could apply for this i could apply for that you know let them think about the next level because uh have you guys thought about combining showing people where those resources are at so they can know what's gonna be available for them next there's definitely a whole re-entry illinois map that's already out there. And we've also thought about expungement map. Um, also on our website, we're building out expungement resources, telling people to reach out to us and then connecting them directly to Legal Aid Chicago as well, because you can't even work at Jewel Osco if you have a criminal record. You know, there's a, it's extremely limiting. <laughs> um, extremely the limiting. The world's crazy, right? Like, uh, I don't know how, uh, if you guys are familiar with history, Marion Barry. The mayor, oh, yeah, Tuesday, right <laughs> now. I we all know the one mess up thing, but the man who actually was a historic uh, uh civil rights uh, his past, right? He the man was a beloved badass, and I'd probably say probably till his end of day was, but you know, he got caught smoking crack, but he would have got fired from McDonald's instead. He was re elected twice to the mayor of DC. You know, we have to reevaluate what we consider what you're allowed to do on your weekend <laughs> as a punishment, right? For your job. Yeah, it's all perception. Yeah. yeah. You know, the weirdest thing is like nothing's changed in the 70 plus years since the, the LaGuardia port reports came out in New York, where it was like, all right, this shouldn't be criminalized. You know, you're trying to legislate a morality. And when you're trying to legislate a morality, you create real problems in actual people's lives based only on your own moral prejudice. And so I'm glad that you think that it's bad or like as Jeff Sessions said, bad people or good people don't do marijuana. I'm glad that you think that. But your moral opinion (laughs) should not come into like somebody's actual fucking life where you send them to prison. You make them check a box. They can't get a goddamn job at Jewel Osco for crying out loud. Yep. But uh, all right. So um, let's see here. Uh, Mo, uh, is it possible to expunge a record without an attorney? Uh, yes, definitely. Um, you know, you can function, you know, pro se. Um, I've I've done it personally, um, not for a cannabis conviction, but um, the the process is just it it's tedious. Um, it's it's not clear cut. Um, there are resources available like Legal Aid Chicago, and um, we'd highly recommend that you seek um, some sort of of legal support to help you navigate through the process. Uh, you can definitely do it yourself, but you know it doesn't hurt to to reach out for support to make sure that things are done properly, to make sure that the, the paperwork is completed properly, et cetera. So um, short answer, yes, you can do it yourself, but you know, don't don't hesitate to to reach out to support. And um, organizations like Legal Aid Chicago, they they do provide uh, their services. Um, you know, it's possible to receive services free of charge or depending on, you know, your income, um, you know, fees are offered on, on a sliding scale. So, um, like I said, it doesn't hurt to reach out uh, for that legal support to make sure that it's done properly uh, the first time. 
But also don't pay like a hundred thousand dollars to a lawyer. Yeah, exactly. Like don't find an attorney. No, I, I want to know when you want to pay a hundred thousand dollars to a lawyer. You can email me at tom at collateral.com. <laughs> I can explain to you how much shit should cost in within theory. And that's one of the problems. And, and I'm small aside, because uh, a lot of people that might be upset uh, and they're they're social equity applicants and they might be wondering how much it costs. And so I've told them, and you can go to the the, the courses uh, section on cannabis industry lawyer. Com. The first lesson I really like break down how much it'll probably cost. And uh, if you're just a regular social equity applicant, it will be hundreds of thousands of dollars to try to get into that lottery. If you're a, uh, a veteran, it will still be tens of thousands of dollars, maybe a hundred thousand dollars to try to get in uh, because that it, it, it's a smaller lift because then you just have to say, I should have been perfect as opposed to you have to knock everybody out. That's, that's a veteran. And so that's one of the reasons why I think the veteran points are how they're tabulated uh, needs to be amended for more equity. And so like, not only do we need to amend that, but we also need to do this license caps because you don't want to have super wealthy, extremely well-connected people. I mean, and maybe we shouldn't use KPMG. Well, there's exactly. been, but the 10 license cap. And so like, I'm not going to say, okay, the 10 license caps got to go. But I think if you can swoop in and get them all in one round, that aspect of it allows you to uh, really try to game the system where somebody who's got a lot of money and they, they didn't pay their lawyer $100,000. They probably paid them three to 400,000. And so uh, that that team can come in and put that together and for like a half a million dollars, end up with 38 lottery tickets. And so that's just, you know, then what? You, now you have, you spent a half a million dollars and you walked away with 10 cannabis licenses in Illinois. That is a huge, and then whenever you talk to white dudes that are into business, they will sometimes use the word Delta. And so uh, when they say that, it basically means like upside or change. It depends on if they're talking about equity options. And then, uh, so that 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 change, for like, here's $500,000 and you leave and it's worth, 40, 80, 90 million dollars. That's yeah. a hell of a that's a hell of a flip. Return. Yeah, yeah. huge yeah. return. Huge. And that's just taken away from you guys, from your pockets, you know, as that's it's an yeah. and that's one of the reasons why, at least in the bill, they've built in these types of programs. And you guys were mentioning rap sheets at the front end. And one of the R3 uh, applicants that reached out to me had a cool idea. It was rap sheets to resumes. And uh, so hopefully, he, he, I mean, he, I think he got it submitted on time. Hopefully it'll be uh, awarded well, because that would be a good investment where now the state is paying for this, this nonprofit uh, charity. Well, it's a public service. It's not a charity uh, so that people can get the expungement. And now let's work on the resume. And oh, well, by the way, avoid Jewel Osco. And so, uh, you know, it's those types of programs are actually built into the statute and they carve up the dollar as to where it's going to go. But uh, uh, Mo, what do you think your opinion is of the MORE Act in Congress? Are you familiar with it? No, I'm not. actually. Oh, uh, Alex, have you heard of the MORE Act in Congress? Um, definitely heard of it several times. What is your thoughts? I want to hear your thoughts. I first. think it's kind of like Illinois for the country. And so I'm worried about it, but I'm optimistic about it because it, 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 it legalizes it, it puts taxes on it, and it puts reinvestment and expungement in it. And I'm like, man, seeing how it's going in Illinois to try to roll this out from not just 12 million, but 330 million, holy crap, that would create a whole bunch of headaches. It just seems like we have a whole bunch of issues that we quite haven't figured out yet. Um, but I also definitely am a full believer in work locally um, because that's where things will actually impact you. Mm -hmm. um, you can pass something on a federal level, but when it actually comes down to implementation on a local level, like it could just not happen. There could be so many different obstacles in the way. I mean, there's so many places in downstate Illinois that don't even have access to internet in so many ways. And so you can pass something on a federal level, but if you're not about to actually figure out local partners, you know, to make things happen and implementable, that is where I have a bigger issue. Um, I'm like, do what you're going to do on the federal level. I'm going to stay local and figure it out here and actually stay grounded and not have, you know, my head in the clouds of like, <laughs> let's do it. Let's get yeah. it done. There's so many things that sound great in theory, but in practice, it's just... I feel Alex is a, a disheartenedness, you know, like like Tom said, it's it's Illinois for the country, 
But I think even at that point, fingers crossed, there'd be interstate commerce. There would be all kinds of things that would be no double tax, no money laundering, no jail, no well, <laughs> no federal jail. But yeah. then you know that with the DEA, they'd still be like, but we can still arrest them, right? You know. And in Chicago, uh, you know, that's something that we were really trying to push on the forefront of like it's still illegal for people that are under 21 years old. Please do not arrest young people for cannabis. Like that is doing nothing for people. Please do not arrest anybody for, and this is my opinion, but any type of drugs at any point, we should never be criminalizing drugs in any ways. That is a waste of our taxpayer money and it is ineffective and it is not stopping any type of issues that are going on by any means. And yeah. there are so many, like several case studies that Thing, where things are laid out for us. Take a look at what happened in Portugal, for instance, with um, full legalization. It's just like we know what the results are. It's just common sense to do it here. It's just yeah. young black people are still being arrested for cannabis. Yeah. Our Chicago Police Department was not trained on possession limits or anything of that sort. And so that's why we're also more going towards less uh, investment in policing of drugs and more education in schools, more mental health clinics, more anything that's good for community or supports or props up community and less of putting our community members behind bars. Yeah. 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 Uh, Capone, the IRS. And if that the IRS would catch Capone, I don't understand because you know, if you're selling drugs, it's it's the the tax people are not that dumb. And so granted, if they aren't paying their taxes and they're living in a 10 million dollar, you know, uh, mansion, that'll catch up to them. So, like, uh, it would be great if the IDOR just uh, just the, the Illinois Department of Revenue, the, the state's IRS, just starts emailing invoices. Hey, uh, you remember all that we just sold last quarter? Where's our cut? You know, as opposed to just sending in the people with the battering ram and all that stuff, you know, we're going to have to audit you. That would be hilarious. And that's the way that I would prefer it, because if you're going to regulate something, regulate it with taxes, don't yeah. regulate it with guns and, and prison sentences and felonies and lifetime, uh, you know, you just and then the, the penalty enhancements. Fuck those. What the shit is that? The guy's selling some weed, and then because you found a gun on him, now he's looking at like a bazillion years in prison as opposed to... All right. Yeah. Yeah. And so we need to be looking at these judges that in Illinois and Chicago, we have the right to vote on. They're going to be up for retention. We need to look at the judges that are putting people behind bars because of small cannabis or drug charges. Um, that is just ridiculous. Is normal anybody like that monitoring... The, the judicial system out there like that? The normal, I'm not sure. Yeah, the normal has the, uh, the what they call it, normal legal counsel or something like that, or legal commission, NLC. And, and it's a nationwide network of attorneys that can join that. Uh, now, most of them are criminal uh, attorneys, but more and more of them are business attorneys because uh, industries are popping up in any state that legalizes it. So, like, again, the Illinois cannabis industry in three years will probably be multi-billion dollars, two to three oh, billion easy. dollars a year. And that is real tax money that goes to help real people in Illinois. And so that excites me. But now it's just uh, all this implementation and execution. And so I really hope in the next round we can learn from what we did wrong in this round and not rush to go into next license type. Because like imagine all these rich people are now like, hey, uh, no, this is how you get the maximum amount of licenses. Talk to that guy, you know, because they all go to the same club. And yeah. then uh, and then what happens? Well, it's, it's freaking true. And so uh, if they just knew that their their profit grab isn't going to be 80, 90 million dollars for the one million that they, they invest or so, but it's going to be maybe like 10 million. And the only way things are going to change is if we are loud about it. Things right. aren't just going to change next round. It's going to take folks being organized and showing up, digging direct action and having demands of transparency and what we want to see. Um, and that's what we've known so far to be true is that if the people don't say it, it's not going to happen. Right. Organize, reach out to your local legislators, demand change. Write checks to your politicians. Don't, yeah. vote for them. <laughs> don't vote for them if they don't support Organize. marijuana. Exactly. You Alice can look up lobbyist gifts. Look up where? Oh, lobbyist gifts. You can look up. Yeah, we should. You can look up lobbyists. Put that in the in the description. But where can we find you guys at Cannabis Equity Illinois Coalition? 
We have a website, CannabisEquityIL.org. Uh, you can also find us on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook, at CannaEquityIL. Um, we couldn't do Cannabis Equity IL because Facebook won't let you say cannabis. So it's Canna <laughs> Equity IL. <laughs> DM us. I thought, I thought Facebook hadn't banned cannabis, but they had only banned the word marijuana. They banned mm. cannabis now too? They've banned cannabis, speaking from personal experience, yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we've been shadow banned for six years. Yeah, we have. Uh, but we will throw those links in the description. Thanks again for coming on and thanks for tuning in, everyone. Make sure you like and subscribe to keep up with all cannabis legalization news. We'll see you on Wednesday. Thank you very much.